Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. What's up, folks? Yep, it's that time. It's time for another exciting episode of the Rich Redman Show where we talk about all things music, motivation, success, and a whole lot more. But these are the three things that really drive us, inform us, inspire us. Know a lot of drummers, a lot of musicians. Drummers are the low-hanging fruit in my life, man. We're around each other. It's this beautiful fraternity, sorority. We lift each other up. This one has been a while in the making, and I'm so excited because today's guest is an Indiana native, multi-instrumentalist, songwriter, and longtime drummer. I'm talking 28 years for John Mellencamp. My friend Dane Clark, what's up, man? Rich, how you doing, man? I'm glad we finally got around to getting this done, brother. You know what, man? We, uh, You have been so good to me over the years. You know, I'm such a fan of you and such a fan of Mellencamp's music. Um, I have seen you at the Ryman Auditorium, yes, and have. I have seen you at the Greek Theater in Los Angeles. That's and uh, I was actually going to go see you last year on a man with on a mandate with my co-host jim mccarthy jim mccarthy voiceovers.com who's usually with us and uh of course jason got a last minute booking and i ended up giving giving the tickets to my one of my longtime students cody hawkins and cody's done really well i've known him since he's like i don't know 14 years old and now he's at least 24 and he's like a band leader and a drummer for this signed act called restless road and they're on the they're on the road doing the amphitheaters and the arenas and so but awesome. he came back from that show going damn that was great oh man great drummer great band i'm like yeah man that's the american <laughs> song that's part of the american songbook indeed it really is you know and that well that's you know that's what makes it you know, the older that you get, like I said, 28 years, I'm 64. Yes, nah, so I'm a, finally a Beatles song title when I'm 64. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and you know, it, it the traveling gets harder, but the band has been, the same band has been together so long. The new guy in the band is the keyboard player, and he's been there for 15 years now. Yeah, so, our new guys have been there 14 years. So Yeah, right? I mean, yeah. it makes a difference. Yes. You know, the, you know what the other guys are going to do. It's uh, you don't have to worry about, you know, oh, is he going to remember this or that? I mean, it just it it makes it better every year, it seems like. And what made this last tour better was Lisa Germano, who left the band right before I joined the band, is back on violin. Oh, great. And she was the original one that played all the stuff on like paper Jubilee, and fire and all that stuff paper and fire and all that yeah. stuff so she's back it has more of that original sound from her and it just helps make it more authentic i think yeah and uh so we're actually getting ready to take off uh i think i fly out for the first gig on march the 4th so we're doing a couple months uh east coast and midwest nice so you guys the way you tour you guys get on the bus and do not come back for several months well, not exactly. We we'll go out for three weeks the, the way it is this time. Now we have done it to where we've been maybe six weeks, and that's really difficult. Um, but this is a three week run, and then we'll fly home for five days, and then a three week run, and then uh, there's maybe some more stuff later on in the summer. This that's nice. Week. Three weeks off, one week off. I mean, that's kind of manageable. Three weeks is a long time, even in yeah. our, in our heyday in the early days of building the perfect beast. Um, we would. St- day out for three three and a half weeks but rarely or like is a uh, americana country act uh based in nashville at least out for right. more than a month you know and a lot of you guys do or a lot of the bands down there do the weekend thing which really, makes sense for everybody for especially if there's session players in the band that helps them keep yes. their thing at home keep the monday tuesday wednesday thing happen right you know yeah yeah, because it has changed. You know, I mean, I'm sure we're going to talk about change and evolution today because you've seen so much over the years. Um, but yeah, there's guys in Nashville that were, you know, triple scale, you know, booked six days a week, players three sessions a day that will now jump in the bunk or get on the flight and go play on the road just because the uh, the mute the health of the music business it's not quite the same as it was, right. And new ago. guys, I mean, sure, new guys are coming in that oh, are sure. kind of t- filling in the spots. And yeah, uh, I was talking about some of this stuff. I did a, a nine day session at Blackbird in uh, July. Yeah, and I was working with uh, with Mark Hill, 
the bass player. Wonderful. Uh, wonderful guy and wonderful yeah. player. I can't say enough good stuff about him. And we locked in immediately. But he was just saying how he's been going out with... Um, oh. Oh, he goes out with uh, either Brooks yeah, I'm trying and to remember. Dunn or... Uh, yeah, Brooks and Dunn. Brooks yeah. and Dunn. Yeah. yeah, he's out there with Greg Morrow. So, yeah, Mar Mark, right. gets, Mark gets around. He's been here for quite some time, multi-decade career. Started, I believe, in the, you know, Christian, Christian. pop world. Made yes. his way, like, over to country and has been in every facet of the country. The alt, the straight down the middle, the southern rock. Yeah, you know. and he can play all that stuff, which we were doing during this session. Uh, this project had everything from bluegrass to old-fashioned 1962 country feels to modern as heavy as you can play americana stuff like you guys do so yeah, it yeah. was really yeah it was really uh it was fun and man great what a what a fun guy to play with yeah you know? who else was in the band huh? um so um brad davis was the co-writer of the songs and he played guitar he was a longtime band leader for billy bob thornton ah. and he actually does when he's around billy bob and he still and he does a lot of movie soundtrack work when That's when it's billy's in the thing yeah it's really good he's a great guy a great musician a great guitar player and he's also one of the funniest dudes i've ever met because he can do uh sling blade better than billy bob and he was doing it for us all day long and i was doing my terrible version of it just because mm -hmm, mustard biscuits mustard and, and know, biscuits yeah. all that stuff and you know and it didn't sound nothing like it but when he did it we would just roll on the floor that is but, hilarious uh, so it was him and um let's see who else was it was really the rhythm oh there was there's a a couple there was another guy from uh michigan that was there for one day and then there was a keyboard player. Um, see, here I am forgetting the guy's name. Oh, dude, that's all right, man. I was just he kinda... was only there for one day. No, no, um, Cohen, Steve Cohen, Dave Cohen, Dave Cohen. Sorry, yeah, 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 yeah. I, he was only there one day, and he's a killer, man. Nice guy. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. There's, there, there's yep. these young lions are here now. Uh, right. You know, it's crazy. You know, isn't it always funny when you're like, you seem like forever. You're the youngest guy in every band. You're the whippersnapper, and then before you know I it, was. you're. You know, you're the old, you're the oldster. You know, you're one of the yeah, one of the older cats. Hey, it's you know, it's okay to be the older cat. That means you're still around. That means we're above dirt, which is the we're best above side of ground, baby. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. And by the way, I am in my studio here, and if this might be overkill, but that's beautiful. I, I thought I would show you. Ooh, this what's is Dane Clark's Thunder Sound Studio? Thunder Sound Studio in. Come uh, on now. Are you in Seymour or where are you? I am no, I'm in I am in a town called Anderson. Anderson, Indiana. Indiana. Yes, sir. The Heartland. It is the Heartland. And is and it it's a, actually the town of my a, birth? Oh, okay. Oh, you're like a Mickey Curry. You never left your a place yeah. of birth. Yep. Pretty exciting when you can not ha not move to Nashville, New York, or LA and still cultivate an amazing career in the music business. Well, I got really lucky, you know. I, I I didn't move away. I I went to college and majored in music at I the university to, at Anderson University. Oh, Anderson! Now, university? I actually went to Ball State for a year and spent way too much time uh, uh, not doing anything productive. And <laughs> that then can happen. Said, yeah. And then my father said, "Look, you know, you can either not go." to college which is okay with me or you can go over here and you can settle down and actually get down to some work which is what i did and when when i got there i was lucky because i was the big fish in a small pond which i actually still am in where i'm at in indiana now as a session guy yeah um, but i was that in school and uh i got to play in all the jazz bands in the wind ensemble i could always read i, I started on piano when i was eight so i could read music Perfect. You know, since then, yeah. And then it went to guitar and then drums. So I still play all those instruments. So that drums but, are your third instrument. Third instrument. Yeah. So yeah. I just had Dax Nielsen on, and he drums are actually his third instrument. It was piano, guitar, drums. Oh, really? Isn't well, that there you go. Well, you know, a piano is great. Uh, and if I was smarter, I would have done it and done it really well. You got melody, harmony, rhythm. It's the basis of all things. You know. Yep. And uh, then I got a guitar when I was young, and I played it like a drum. So I just kind of knew, you know. I still do. I mean, yeah. that's my thing with guitar. I mean, I'm I'm a rhythm guitar player. Yeah. But I, it's just like taking my hi-hat stick and going bing, 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 and I wear picks out 
Like I go through two heavy picks if I'm playing a show with my band, yeah. which I have Dane Clark band since uh, for 22 years. Well, that's smart uh, to have something like that to, to to bring you your creative joy while you go out yeah, and work. You know, I get out and sing, but I'm I'm just pounding through those picks. It's like but my, the guitar player, my real guy, Eric Skull, who's in my band, a real guitarist. He just goes, I can't believe you do keep shredding those things. I break strings a lot too. That's, that's pretty incredible. I think I would do the same thing, you know, and I, and I was trying to practice guitar. My right hand was like solid as a rock, but that left hand was a pile of mush, mm. you know? Yeah. It's just you got, something. You, you got to coordinate these fingers, these fat little fingers, you know? Yeah. You got to develop that stuff, but you could do it. It's yeah. never too late. It's Come never on, too Rich. late to learn a new craft or a new skill. So, mm. you know, working with, uh, you know, Mellencamp 28 years, this yes, is sir. like right in your wheelhouse because along the way, I don't know if it was concurrently or before, you've also worked with folks like John Prine, Steve Earle, Ian Hunter, uh, Janice Ian. You have seven solo records. Yep busy cat man is, yeah you're, speaking of which i'll show that since i've got it sitting yeah, here yeah this is the last ian hunter record that beautiful uh, what's it came, called it's called uh defiance part one ian hunter defiance I'm part on, one i'm on i'm on five songs and i'm on the first song and then ring goes on the second song mm. and then i'm on the third song with jeff beck and then taylor hawkins is on the next song nice and then so it's just us three i think on this record i'm on five of the tracks well you're sharing and credits just, with ringo and jeff beck not bad that's what i'm saying man and in the late taylor hawkins man he was great drummer. god bless god bless. and uh yeah and the other guys on here mike campbell he's not too bad yeah uh joe elliott um gorgeous ring slash uh todd rundgren wadi wachtel brad whitford where was that bad. recorded this was recorded in Mike recorded my tracks here. Nice. So this was it kind of started right after COVID. Yeah. And so everybody did long distance things on it. And actually, there's a Defiance Part Two that's uh that I just signed some contracts for that I played a bunch of songs on. And I actually got when it comes out, and it I could barely play this track because I was told this is the last track that Jeff Beck ever played. Now he's I already played with him once and he'd already passed away oh, on this record. Wow. And this track was really hard to get through, man. You know, yeah. even thinking about it again, it's like, dude, this is that's I heavy. Mean, the man. guy was so incredible. The Whoa. greatest guitar player that I've I mean, my favorite of all time, even more than Hendrix. Well, yeah, literally making he he transcended the instrument to create a new tonality. You know what I mean? Which is like a, a, the mark of of real oh. influence. You know. And, you know, and any drummer's going to, I know you've seen live at Ronnie Scott's. I mean, if that's not the greatest band of all time, I don't know what is. It's not bad. But, but, yeah. but, but I got to, I got to play on that song. Uh, and it was, I, the first day I was trying to do it, I, I had to put my, well, I was using a brush and a shaker stick. It's kind of odd combination, but it was cool. Uh, I couldn't even do it. Ah. I, I had to come back and I had to kind of get my composure. Yes. And I just I said I'm not going to do this today. I'm going to think about this, and and yeah, I went yeah. back and did it the next day. But uh, wow, man, good for but, you. That's a well, quite a story. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, glad to be able to have done that. Thank yeah. you, Ian, and thank you, Jeff Beck. Yeah, isn't it unbelievable that that whether you know someone is signed, unsigned, a legend, or just a beginner. We have a, a place in our homes. Microphones are on our drums, and we can record a particular performance in a space and time and send it over the matrix and it it's could be amazing. glued together to create something that uh, is lasting and is for all time. It's pretty amazing. It's very amazing. And you know, drummers have it the toughest. If you're a guitar player, you get one mic pre, yep. one, you know, a, a stomp box and a, you know, a good microphone, a thousand dollar microphone or whatever, or a 57, yep, you know, too. What, whatever. And we've got, you know, I've got 12 channels in there uh, and I've got 12 channels running through 12 channels of API here. So it's all in it's straight in through Thunderbolt. So I try to make the signal as as clean as, as pure I can. as clean as possible. Yeah, it's a yeah. it's a much major, much more of a major investment. And yeah, and my, some of my gear here is just starting to show a little bit of signs of age. And so you know, every ten years you got to upgrade equipment and all that you kind do. of stuff. So yeah, you know. Yeah, 
I've luckily I haven't changed my uh, and I have universal audio stuff that I'm using and I think I'm going to have to update that because do it and I do a lot of mixing and recording nice. records for folks here and I'm working on three projects I'm trying to get done before we take off in March so uh, this is like my one day that we could yeah. work this in Perfect. and uh, but but anyway I I keep hitting which I'm sure you've done this when you start using more plugins, you know, you get, you get one extra and then you can't the one that you want for like the reverb or whatever. Oh, no, disabled because you're using too much DSP or whatever. So yeah, yeah. CPU got, overload. Uh, yeah. uh, yes. Yeah, all of that crap. So <laughs> one of those things that studio dudes got to, got to yeah. deal with. Now, do you miss, uh, you know, obviously when you're doing the Mellencamp records, you guys are probably in a space together yes. or sharing yes. the air and, you know, moving Definitely. air, which is really exciting and how we all prefer to do it. But so do you ever, do you, do you revel in the loneliness of that, of these, this new paradigm, this new creative process, or do you miss people or do you love, you know, <laughs> uh, I, I don't mind it either way. I mean, there's, there's, you know, the good thing about if you're doing it on your own is that and my usual thing, if I'm recording something, I try not to, cause I'm a guy who's always will write a chart out. If I'm in a session for somebody, or I have yeah. to read a chart, you know, a, a chord chart or whatever. And you know, we all have to do this, but sometimes I don't want to think about that. And if it's a project that I'm doing for somebody, I'll just go play through the song three or four times. And then I'll know by the fourth time, I'll know all the parts. And then usually it'll be that fourth one, or I might do it if it's, it depends on how difficult it is, but usually four times, maybe six, if it's really difficult. Yeah. And usually that fifth or sixth one, I'll, I'll kind of know that's the one I, this is the one I'm going to use. And then I'll just make sure that there's not a fill that I've duplicated or something. And I've, I can squeeze that in there real quick. That's the good thing about it. The bad thing about it is. Yeah, the other dude, you can't change. Like later on, you go, man, once the guitar part came on, I wish I would have done this right there. Because I would have played more musically. So yeah, so when I'm yeah. requesting the tracks, I'm like, hey, yeah, we could build a track from a vocal and a and a, and a scratch acoustic. Right. Um, that happens a lot. And you got to like yep. almost imagine, you know, be an imaginary player of you know, pulling from your knowledge of the last hundred years of music. Exactly. Or um, uh, then you get quite a few tracks and I'm like, hey, are they all staying or which ones are going to be replaced? Are you going to have right. my energy on there? And then you're going to replace me. And then some of those stuff, right. it comes where you're the last piece. Everything is slammed to the grid. And they're just like, well, you just got to replace the program and put some heart yep. and soul into it you know right and i've i've done those exact same things that you're talking about and all that the, the neat thing is is i'm glad i can do that yeah i can do that i mean we can we can sit there and line up on that grid yeah and but there's times when i, I don't necessarily want to on certain no. songs no, Come that's not now. happening on Mellencamp records. You know, I, no. I, I think, it, and even on a lot of our records, even though there's 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 uh, some, you know, slam to the grid loopy elements, I'll play on top of the loop, and instead of slamming it to the grid, if a kick drum is a millisecond off or whatever, they'll just slide it. You know what I mean? You know, yeah. so yep. it's self self preservation. I'm cool with that. You know, I'm cool yeah, with I any of it. That. You know, really. Yeah, that's the that's the way I look at it. It's fine. Yeah, you know it. However, it's going to work. But I must say that I do, I do really enjoy, you know, having a band and just cutting that track and going in and going, wow, that's okay. We know that's it. There's no question. That's the take. That's the take. just because of the way everybody, you know, felt about it. But yeah. a lot of John's records, like the last record that we did, which I'm really proud of. That, now, which one is this? That is. Um, Let's see, you're on the best um, that I could do. Oh, oh or Orpheus, yeah, Orpheus Descending is the is the one that came out last year. Ooh, came nice. out this year. Orpheus this year. Ascending. Yeah, Orpheus and, Descending. Orpheus Descending. And what yeah. was the one? It was something about a clown or something that when I saw you at the Greek theater, you guys were it was like sad tales and clown oh, tears. Sad, and... sad no sad clowns and hillbillies. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, well, this one, this one I really got to play some stuff on. And for listeners out there, if you want to know what I do and what my little bag is and, and some of the I kind of consider myself in John's band, you know, we don't really slam like songs like small town and stuff like that anymore. But it's those more, are it's more muted, almost storytellers. Not, yeah. It's not what he writes anymore. It's not right. the 
field actually and so there's the first song hey god i'm really man that's a kicking song and uh i really love it it's a it's a well-written song it's real interesting should have got on the radio but you know how that goes yeah um there's a tune called perfect world that springsteen wrote right then he sent john some songs he goes you got to do one of these and he goes oh okay and so we arranged this one and what i like about it is it's the, like the slowest halftime groove I've ever played with like a 16th note brush thing. So I'm going, boom. It's like super slow 16th note ballad thing. It's like one and two and boom, hi-hat. So the hi-hat's playing on two and four through the whole tune. Oh, yeah. The, the backbeat's on a giant like, three. So the backbeat's like, and then the, but it's just brushes. So, but anyway, check it out. It's it's cool. And then my favorite one was one that I wasn't even. I was going to play some, just like stir the soup brush on, right? Mm -hmm. And John goes, and I said, I said, can I try something different? And he said, Yeah, do something crazy on it. And I said, Okay, you you asked for it. So there's a song called Amen, which uh, it's uh, I don't know if you remember the drummer from Procol Harum, but there was a guy named B.J. Wilson who was just a wild british drummer he was like a cross between keith moon and and uh mitch mitchell or something yeah yeah and but he, he i was a fan of his and it was like so i was i felt like i walked out the studio and i went okay if levon helm and bj wilson had a couple of drinks together what would they play and boom i played that yeah. and it was like that was the moment you know i got to do it's really there's no backbeat on two and four you just have to hear it it's yeah, no, pretty no. cool I wish I had checked out this this record before we did the uh, the interview, but this is the latest record, and it's called Orpheum. Yes. Orpheus Descending. Orpheus Descending. Yep. Hey, you God, hear Perfect it, World, and, and Amen. Perfect World, and Amen. Listeners, yep. you guys heard it right here. Check it out. It's straight from the horse's mouth. Now, you've been on... Uh, you probably have to update this because there sounds like there's a couple of records that are on the list, but the oh, best yeah. that I could do, John Mellencamp, Rough Harvest, Cutting Heads... Yeah. Trouble No More, Words and Music, Freedom's Road, Life, oh, yeah. Death, and Freedom. And then there was Life, Death, yeah. and Freedom Live. Live, yeah. And then there's yeah, a couple those. more, I think. There's, uh, well, the one before um, um, Orpheus Descending was strictly a one-eyed jack. And that's the one that Springsteen's on two songs. And okay. The, um, and there's one to check out on there where I play, uh, it's one stick and one brush where I'm hitting the side of the floor, Tom. Um, Almost like stick, a... And it's a, like it's a woodblocky kind of a sound, but it's uh, it's that's an interesting song called Sweet Honey Brown. Nice. On that record. And then the two songs that Springsteen played, he, he played a blistering lead guitar on a song called Did You Say Such a Thing? Ah. It's really cool. So I get really nervous. Uh, if it's a vintage drum set or if it, you know, no matter what, I get weird about hitting the side of the, of, of the shell uh, on a floor. Uh, well, you know what? So ever <laughs> since I've got to tell this story then. So, cause I've been beating on stuff and tearing it up the whole time I've been in this guy's band. Well, you've so, got like some vintagey drums. When I think when I saw you at the run, well, there, there was like a bomber bass drum, right? Kind of. Yeah. Well, yeah, but it really wasn't vintage it was made to look vintage ah. so here's what happened so when i you know i did i auditioned for the band 28 years a, ago the year was it would have been 1996 in uh yeah yeah in uh, maybe i think it would have been about may was it a cattle call or just it a was a bunch of dudes yeah. bunch of dudes from all over the world People flying actually. in yeah flew in uh yeah, I won't mention any names, but a bunch of guys. And uh, so I'll just t I'll talk tell you about the audition. So I got there. It seemed like I was able to get there. And of course, I set my own stuff up. You know, there was so I brought my kid in, set it up. Um, luckily, it was a time when they'd broken for dinner. And then and I knew all the guys in the band. That's how I, I was the only Indiana guy that got an audition. Because I had already played with the guitar player that had left, Larry Crane. Excuse me. I was yeah. in his band in 1990. Yes. And I had already played, and John does, didn't remember it, but the movie soundtrack to F Falling from Grace 
I was on that because Kenny was out of town doing something. And this session came up and Larry Crane said, well, let's, you need to use this guy. He's a set main session guy in Indiana, Indianapolis. Now, were you and so, uh, uh, Kenny friendly at this point? Colleagues? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 He, he would come to, because he would come to the same studios that I was at. And he'd always come in and say, okay, show me your new, what, what's the new Vinny lick that you got? And I'd show him something and he'd go damn man that's cool let, let me see that and he we, we show each other new stuff lick of the week or whatever yeah and this is back in 80 i don't know probably 87 or 88 so a long time ago but anyway i had gotten in larry crane's band he got me on the session down there so i played on that soundtrack and that's actually when i met john prine and got to play with him and uh it was that had to it be was great. it was interesting but it, it was nice to I already knew what that was going to be like when I joined the band six years later. It's like, oh, okay, I see how this works here. I get it. So, but he hadn't remembered. So while, so skip up to 1996. So I had two songs that I played. He, they said, pick two songs and then we'll just jam. I said, oh, great. So I picked, uh, love and happiness. Do you remember that song? Cause it was the heavy one. And I thought, Oh, I get to use a double bass pedal. Yeah. So that was, so I did that. And so that was the first tune I did. And it, well, here's what it was. They said, Oh, John, John's not even going to come in. He's going to listen outside. And I said, well, that's fine. I've met him before, whatever. So right at the last second, he comes in and he sits down and looks right at me, but it, I'm going, okay. Hey man, remember I played on the soundtrack. So we play this, we play love and happiness. I killed it. And his wife at the time comes in. <laughs> and she was the like, model actress, right? <laughs> Gal. Yes, yes. Yes. And, uh, but I, I was just kind of staring at her and I thought, Oh shit, I've already messed this up. Um, so, but now she goes, that sounded great. And he goes, Hey, come up here for a second. And then, uh, so I'd already kind of, you know, I knew I'd killed it, right? So I got up and he, he goes, he looks at me and he goes, he goes, I think you'd look, I think you'd look pretty good with all that contemporary Christian hair cut off. Cause he'd heard I'd played on these records. And at the time I had quite, the the dude. Yeah. I had the mullet and the curls and the Beautiful. dew. And it was like, yeah. I said, man, I don't care. I shave my old body. I don't care. And, uh, anyway, he thought I was funny. You know what I mean? So I went back and played the other song, killed it. Uh, which was paper and fire. Nice. Easy, right up my alley. And then he said, okay, he goes, Dane, why don't you play the intro to Honky Tonk Women and we'll just jam. And so I knew what that was. Yep. And I, I've told every student that I've ever had, if I wouldn't have known that, I wouldn't have known the reference to a lot of John's music and I would have been out the door, yes. no matter how good I was at the other stuff or how much I could get along with people. You know, what absolutely. I'm well, that's so, a dream, man. That's one of my favorite uh, jam songs. Right. So you, it's just a thing you should learn, you know, absolutely. so I tell people, if you're going to go in for an audition, you better not only know that person's music, but the music that influenced them smart and the, what they're going to expect out of you is going to come from that. Well, as well as the well that they've created themselves. Yeah, man. So great advice. So, so that was 1996, and I'm still hanging around with those fellas. Well, and see, I you remember, know, yeah, you know how to keep a gig too, and that's yeah. that's a deep understanding of reading the room and people and relationships and how those relationships can change and grow. And if somebody's yes. having a bad day, and being able to take a high road and uh, be able to read between lines, yes, a lot of stuff. All of those things, because and, he uh, doesn't have a he does not have a a reputation as being a person that is incredibly easy to work with no he does not and uh you know and i've got people all the time want me to say something like oh i've heard john mellencampson and i go look man i'm not going to say anything about john he's been yeah. employing me for 28 years yeah, and it works for him you and know. it works you know we I, what he likes what i do and i like playing his music so there you go we get along fine yeah there it is there you go everybody's always looking for a uh, way to to uh eat you or incriminate you it's gets so old it is weird and i know it's happened to you too it's like oh yeah you kidding me yeah and you know then then i i would hear rumors about in the 
musical circles around Indiana of immediately when I got in that band of how much money I was making a week and well, you know, then I had to move down to Bloomington and, and to a house next door to John and just not the weirdest stuff. Yeah. You know, yeah. You Monday was cut the lawn day. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Tuesday I had to take a pizza. I had to take a pizza down to him and you know, I just heard all this crazy stuff and it's like, man, it's yeah. just a gig. Don't you guys got a life? Don't worry about it. Yeah. Uh, we're cool here. Yeah. So Now in the beginning, um, you know, Kenny had such a you know large presence and personality, and mm. from those early, I think he did it for seventeen years. Um, at that point, was John still when you joined looking for the crash, boom, bang, super, super high energy on the small town stuff, or was it already making a transition to eh, maybe we'll well the, this a little bit? Or? Not necessarily. I, I was still. I mean, that was one of the reasons they hired me because I could play hard like that. Yeah, and you know, I can I can whack them. Yeah, which you can too, man. Yeah, um, and so that was part of the appeal. I think they just liked the way I made music feel. Just my basic feel, like man, that that's a pocket. And he yes. uh, he always called me in, in the pocket, man. I love the pocket that you've got. So what they did want, they actually wanted less. They wanted the feel. They wanted the power, and they wanted the dynamics, but maybe less fills. All right. You know, even less cymbal crashes. At one rehearsal, I remember, don't play any cymbal crashes. Okay. That, but I can't last for very long unless you're making that one Peter Gabriel record. record I, yeah. You know, you know. so it ended up being where... It, it was and was, I, was it a right, phase? Was it a it phase? It was kind of a phase, but you yeah. know what? It's changed the way that I played thereafter to this day. Yeah. Because when I listen to modern records, they are crash happy. A lot They're of too crash happy for me. A lot of crashes. And you know what? If you can limit that to four crashes a song or something, like if you have to hit one on the chorus, here we go. Or maybe wait till the second chorus if you can somehow. Yeah. It, sometimes you can't. But uh so I started thinking differently. And he that what he was trying to get me to do was think differently about what I'm doing. Don't just play the same. And you know, I was dumb enough to go. Well, I could just go Pat Boone, Debbie Boone, Pat Boone, Debbie Boone, and Nina. Ever since then, Dane, I don't want to hear none of that Pat Boone, Debbie Boone. I, I don't want to hear that one. So. Well, the problem is, is it's so good and it works, and 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 it's you know what <laughs> I, I mean. Know. And it worked for the Motown guys and the Stax guys uh, and the I, classic rock guys and the. I know. So you have to so, you have to disguise it. You have to, which I, I've snuck it in, like Pat Boone, Debbie Boone. Yeah, it's or, still Sat Boone, Dat Boone, Dat Boone. You know, yeah, but so anyway, I just felt like I feel like I've been a more economical player since yeah. I got in the band. Now, you know, if I'm doing a fusion tune or something, look out, or you know, if yeah. I'm doing a jazz gig or which I love to do that stuff or playing a Latin thing, yeah, I love to play all kinds of music. But when I'm in that groove, I just want to make the song sound the best that I can. I'm not worried about, and that's the cool thing about the whole band the whole melon camp band we're team players we we want the music to sound as good as it can we want to make john sound as good as we can perhaps that's a job that's, man what, that's is that's johnny job, still right? there on, is johnny still there on yes bass? he is yeah, johnny yeah, g's man. playing bass yeah man i mean we got we've been playing that music together he joined the band right after me so he's been there 25 years yeah so it's like man when you got a rhythm section like that come on and mike watchick's been there since the beginning so oh my god i remember I mean, when i auditioned for uh when I auditioned for Dina Carter in 1997, he was, he was putting her band together. I think he got to see my audition. And the funny thing is, is I was living in Dallas and uh, flew in for the audition. And when she said, where do you live? I should have slid and said Nashville uh, because I did that three times in a row. Where do you live, kid? Where do you live, kid? And I was just like, I should have been just like here and then just figured it out and made it happen. But I wasn't, I wasn't uh, worldly enough to think that way. You know, mm. maybe but anyways, it maybe it wasn't the right thing. I mean, I oh, everything happens that, for a reason, right? You know, I th I feel that that it does. Yes. Yeah. So. But no, you're you're a master of like you could do the big beat, but then you're also thinking about colors and there's a brush in this hand, there's a shaker in this hand, and I got this weird, right. you know, knuckle bear thing taped to the hi hat, and I love all that yeah. stuff. The you know, a rivet symbol, a flat ride, like just combining different sounds and thinking outside of the box. And I know Kenny had to do it in the early days with. Uh, uh, I need I need a beat 
Aronoff, I need a beat. I need a beat. Yeah. You know, and and Kenny was like, "I'm." It's a very similar song as the last one, but I got to come up with <laughs> right. something different. You know, right? And that's yeah. and that's the whole deal. I mean, it's that's the deal to this day. Yeah, he does want you to. He pushes you to come up with something that you've not done before. And live, the one thing that I got that everybody I get every time we go out on tour, I get an email at least one a day from some drummer that was in the audience nice. that finds DaneClark.com and says, what is that thing over on the, by your floor, Tom, that you're playing? Yeah. And it's a, it's the piece of the shell of a, of a Tom that it's a wood block. Yes. Because, you know, it's John would say sometimes, I just want to hear that hi-hat all night. It's driving me crazy. I don't want to hear it. Okay. So he digs the sound of that. So on a lot of verses, I mean, yeah, you know, I'll do that too. I mean, sometimes the Charlie Watts thing works better than, you know, where you leave the two and the four mm. off Yeah, will work better. But I use that and I'll accent it too. Put a little accent thing on it. And speaking of Charlie Watts. Now, Dane, I remember you playing that thing, but I don't remember how you mount it and such. So I'm going to have to get a picture or something and so I can steal it. Speaking of Charlie Watts. Oh, there's a picture of of uh, Dane and Charlie. That looks like a good 20 years ago. It was exactly 20 years ago. Oh, my God. Oh, and you know what? So look, look at the picture closely. Now, where was so, it? This was in uh, this was in Las Vegas. This is the Cotton uh, Club. It was uh, that was the backstage area. That's what they had. That was the I've got one of those here that I stole from. I took off the wall. But so we were playing for a guy that owned an airline was throwing a party for himself because it was his birthday. So he had Robin Williams open the show. Then we played for 45 minutes. And then we got to see these guys. Wow. Play at the joint at the Hard Rock Cafe. Nice. And uh, was quite, uh, quite a quite a moment. Was Charlie a, a friendly, affable Englishman? Sweet, sweetest guy I ever met. Oh, here's the. So here's a backstory on that. So during sound check, we got finished and his, I don't remember his drum tech's name, but he, he uh, I can't remember that guy's name, but he was really sweet. And he goes, oh man, you're a great player. I, he introduced himself and I said, oh, thanks, man. He goes, hey, you want to see Charlie's kid? And I said, well, yeah, duh. So, <laughs> it, it, you know, it was covered up with a blanket or whatever. So, so the rest of the band had taken off. So he pulls it out and I'm looking at it and I'm looking at the batter head of the bass drum. And it's a silver dot Ludwig head or a silver dot head. And I said, man, that I didn't even know they made those anymore. He goes, man, they haven't made, they don't make those. He goes, that's been on there since 1975. No, the same head. He like, didn't want it changed. Well, I mean, well, you know, God. he only was, he was only going like boo, boo, boo on it. So it wasn't, he never would wear it out, but you would think. So he I never know, stomped man. on the kick. No, when, when he when he when he played the cymbals, they were going like this. They didn't, you know, they didn't go. Psh. It was just like they just kind of move, and he just played. He just did his thing, and he didn't have to hit the drums hard. He just played about like this. That so, has been on there since nineteen. But when he told me that, I just went nineteen seventy five, and you could see it. There was like. Uh, confetti coming out of it or something from must have been part of the show that year like we had gotten stuck in there's a couple pieces of that and, and there's there was no uh flam slam no, pad no or... nothing 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 that would scare and the hell the... out of me to play rock and roll without a flam slam pad. well me too well me too i've always done that yeah. but he you know, had of course he had a soft beater i can't remember what if it was a old oh. speed king or what it was yeah. i can't remember but it was just it, just seeing that but he was very gracious to and he shook my hand and he said oh man you've been you took tenny's place and man that's really cool man that's he was just as nice as he could be and uh beautiful yeah god beautiful. rest his soul yeah. yeah i mean he left a legacy for us to steal from man oh Incredible. no question they got so, i gotta tell you this one other story yeah of course uh, but, uh, so i got to meet ginger baker one time <laughs> i've got somewhere i've got an album i didn't pull it out that he signed for me so now this, this can is, go either way with his reputation. <laughs> well, it's no, he was nice to me. Good. Um, so they had his drums. They had a, a silver sparker lug Ludwig kit, double bass, Tom's flat cymbals flat. Like he played them funky little stands, not 
modern stance or anything. And this would have been, this was 1988. So the drum shop in Indianapolis and, uh, they said, Dane, would you get up and, uh, cause I, everybody, I was the studio guy. Would you, would you get up and do a sound check on Ginger's drums? I said, well, okay, sure. So I got up and I was just, you know, kick <laughs> snare. And then all these, he had all these beautiful old K Zildjian symbols that were, I mean, just, they'd never been cleaned, but boy, they sounded great. Yeah. I'd hit, I'd hit in that ride symbol. And I thought, Oh, I wish I had that. Damn. And the crashes sounded great. And then I hit the hi-hat and I went, oh my God. And I could tell because when I was a kid, I was infatuated with cream and the uh, song Crossroads. That's, that's still my favorite guitar solo. Anybody yeah. to play. And the sound of those hi-hats, I knew it. Same pair. I knew it was the same pair. And I went back and I asked him, he said, that's the symbols I used in cream. Wow. But he met me. He had a briar pipe in his mouth, clenched in there, and a in a mixed drink in this hand. And he shook my hand. I said, God, nice to meet you, Ginger. He almost broke my arm. And he was a strong guy. Yeah. Nineteen eighty eight, man. If you have you ever seen the Ginger? Have you seen the the? Yeah, uh, I mean, documentary. He's, he gets kicked out of every city he moves to. <laughs> That's I mean, exactly right. You've got to be pretty crazy to be kicked out of kicked out of cities. I know, right? God bless him. But he, yeah. here was the, here was the thing about that I wanted to say about it. Yeah. So, because a lot of people thought, "Oh, Ginger Baker, is a joke." Do, 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 do. Oh, come on! And I said, "Dude, no, you don't. If you if that's all you know, you just don't know. Right. You don't get it." So he came out, and I don't think he he had just started playing again because he had been working on it. He had gotten clean off heroin for the first time in twenty five years for a Yikes. little while. For oh. a little while, and anyway. He had worked on an olive farm, and that's why he was so strong. And he must have been practicing a little bit before he came. So anyway, he was playing. He never played anything real fast, but he's playing the ting ting, swinging him around a little bit. And then he starts doing this. He's got, da, 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 da. he's playing in six, right? Dun, da, dun. Got, da, 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 da. And then he starts doing this thing on top of it, and he's got his his foot over here is doing like a dun, da, like a triplet thing, and then he's going on top of all that. Blah, 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 blah. I can't even describe it. I couldn't do so it for it, you it, now. It was very African. Kind it of was a... very African. I mean, that's mm -hmm. that was his thing. He studied with uh forget the guy's name, Phil Seaman, who was yeah. uh yeah. Uh, unfortunate last name. It's a, but, it's uh, a very <laughs> troubling last name. <laughs> but but uh anyway, this and I just looked around the room and I saw jaws drop and I go, I would have tried to tell you morons that this guy really had a deep he had a deep groove, man. Yeah, man. He had a thing that was fantastic. So I got to got to shake his hand. You got he, some he, two two royalty right yeah, there, man. Yeah, Cause right. Because I, I was going to ask you, like early influences, mm. um, early influences. What you know? Mm. What is your route? Mount Rushmore? The typical guys: Charlie, Ringo. Well, Charlie, Ringo. Um, of course, Keith Moon. I was a, totally infatuated with Moon because. When I go back and I found some tapes of me jamming in high school, I never played two and four. I thought, well, he never plays two and four. I don't want to mess around with that. <laughs> What's the point? And of course, I'm in a band where I, that's the thing, right? That's the so, thing. <laughs> um, but those guys, and then of course, Bonham, when the very first Led Zeppelin record came out, about the time I got, I'm trying to remember probably about this time a little bit before I got my first drum set. But the first time, I, first song I wanted to be able to play was Good Times, Bad Times. Yeah. You know, so, and I can play it. And I could even kind of play it, even though I didn't want to hit two and four back then. But uh, John Bonham was incredible. Uh, Ian Pace. I, uh, yeah. Great drummer. Um, great hands. And, great hands. Uh, oh, man, no question. And when I got into college is when... I realized I wasn't sure what I was going to, I thought maybe I'd be a band director or something. I didn't really want to. I played in a rock band on the weekends. So we played songs by the who and stuff. That's what I wanted to do. No, I didn't want to be a band so, director either, but that was what my degree was in. I was like, let's get something safe here. You know? So you did go for that. I got my master's in music education. So I am did over, you? overly qualified for jumping well, through hoops. <laughs> well, good for you, man. That's cool. Yeah. I couldn't take it. I couldn't take the education classes. I said, oh, oh it my sucked. God. It's like on the French horn. I learned how yeah. to play hot cross buns on the bassoon. Uh, oh, and, oh, sure. Yeah. I, like, I, I, I just, yeah, I decided I could just couldn't do it. No, yeah. I'm not going to do oh, this anymore. So I, I was, so I was even dumber and I got a, 
performance degree. Yes. Uh, that's really going to do a lot for you. Uh, which I would advise anybody out there, don't do that. Well, you get, you know, you get the time in the trenches, you know, your 10,000 hours. <clears throat> but I was thinking to myself, you know, Greg Bissonette gave me the advice. He was like, you know, you can, if you're going to be a great player, just practice. He says, but as far as like getting a degree, you might as well just get the music education degree because it's, mm. you could always be the percussion yeah. specialist at a 5A high school or whatever. Used to, I, all these things I didn't want to do, but I was like, that sounds all right. Yeah, it sounds like the plan. But you, you wanted to have a backup plan. Well, I decided it, at that point I, I was just going to go for that. But Heck yeah. that's that's when I got realized. That's when I found out about Steve Gadd. That's the, the teacher there. He's a good friend of mine still, Jeff Nearpass. Thanks, Jeff, for he's going, Dane, you're a good player, but have you ever heard this? And I just went, oh, so it was probably you know, like all, the lep, like uh, uh, Paul Simon, or maybe all, uh, all of that stuff. Uh, the, yeah, well, he leprechaun. was actually he he had that stuff, but no, he had. If you've ever heard, have you ever heard "Smoking in the Pit"? No. It's a live record by Steps Ahead. Oh wow, that's unbelievable. When when Gad was in Steps Ahead, nineteen eighty, nineteen eighty. But then I went back and heard, of course, the Leprechaun and uh, the Mad Hatter. Yeah, and uh, uh, and I just went okay, so I started transcribing. And I transcribed two or three uh, transcription books, you know, of of music notation of Steve Gadd stuff. Yes, and, and Vinny stuff. And then I then I found out about Vinny, so I was transcribing Frank Zappa things. Hey, Not how about black, that Joe's Garage, man? How Joe's about Garage. That? I, I learned a ton of stuff from Joe's Garage. It sounds like it was recorded yesterday. It holds yes. up so well. But my favorite track on that is um, uh, "Lucille Has Messed Up My Mind." Yeah. Vinny's uh, reggae fusion. I stole all my reggae stuff back 40 years ago. Cyborg, isn't that? Yes. That's a reggae tune on there, yeah. too. Yeah. I want to go back that, and listen. I haven't. Yeah. Yeah. I want to go back and. Of course. And you know, he was, all that stuff. Yeah. And, uh, and of course, he was taking the gad, you know, that. He was taking that thing and, and bending it around in his own way too. Yeah. Oh, the uh, are you, did you do the 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 just the the, the cross hand you know? The, oh yeah. 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 The six one sixteenth displaced thing that I used to drive people crazy practicing at sessions when I was first you know when I was yeah. twenty three yeah. you know they were going if you play that one more time I'm going to strangle you yes but I I learned how to do it I can um, it's in, but, it's yeah, in your what, bag of tricks. It it is, and once I discovered those guys, and then I then I went back and discovered Tony Williams, and went, oh wow, I love this guy, you know, especially. I mean, of course, the Miles Davis stuff you can't touch, but the new Tony Williams lifetime when he was with Alan Holdsworth and those guys, you know, and I still, you know, I've I've done a version of Snake Oil and Fred that I've I've got transcriptions of those, and that's some of the finest drumming of all time. It's love so it's so. Uh, dangerous sounding i mean it like is early fusion and his big flams and the big tubby yellow gretches and yeah just fear fearless and dangerous and dirty just that loose hi-hat just just sloshing away just <laughs> furious and that foot just you know the all the you know where his right <laughs> hand you know, he's doing the triplets in the 16th and those fills where they just <laughs> love it man it's, uh, if, it's I, if I want to get excited about drumming again, if I'm kind of going through, oh, I got to go to this session and go boo, boo, boo again, I'll listen, listen to Tony Williams and go, okay, I, I know yeah. I can come back and I'll, I'm going to run through this song when this session's over. You yeah, know, man. Make me, make me feel better. Yeah, dude. Money beat number two. Boom, crack, mm. boom, boom. It worked for it worked for the Eagles. It worked for <laughs> yes, sir. the Eagles of death metal. It works for <laughs> any Abba to Zappa. You're going to play that. It's going to work. I love it. Okay, so we have a lot of similar um, similar interests, and then uh, I love the fact that you have your own band and you 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 put out music. I'm looking at some of these titles here. If people want to go yeah, to DaneClark.com, you got seven solo, some of which are uh, um, well, well, nine also actually. I've got Dane Clark oh, in the back room. Dane Clark in the back room, boys. I have two. I've got especially. I encourage people to check out the songs from Isolation that I recorded here in my studio with long distance from my buddies, and I wrote all the songs, mixed it here, and nice. my friends long distance and John Sebastian joined me for nice. four songs, and uh, he's the coolest guy in the world. I emailed 
I went to his website and I thought I never even talked to him before, but I did a song on here, a cover called sitting, sitting in limbo that he had done. I actually thought it was his song, but it was a reggae song. It was Jimmy Cliff's song. What a perfect song to do during the COVID, right? Sitting yeah, I in mean, limbo. I, I was, <laughs> I was now, now really quick, this record, um, uh, people get, people give me CD sometimes. Here's a CD of that record that you played on. Thanks a lot, man. I don't have a CD player. I drink the Kool-Aid. I need to probably get a CD. Are these things on Spotify or Apple Music? Yes, they're releases? on everything. Okay, all, all my stuff's everywhere. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's yeah, everywhere. But but anyway, yeah, this this is the archaic actual CD. But it does have a bonus track. Mm -hmm. Um, but anyway, he was nice enough. He's he's become a friend and nice enough to uh to play on four songs. He liked the first one so much, he said, sure, man, send me some more stuff. But uh we got in uh USA Today with this. I got nice. into in from the first uh, video that we did from it. You got, got a publicist a or you just kind of like, I, I did, I did, I did, I did hire a guy for yeah, that. Nice. And we got an American songwriter twice and uh, Americana highways and, and all that stuff. Great. Just fabulous reviews. It's gotta be great because you spend all this time bringing people in that genres, their hopes, their dreams, their storytelling, their heartbreaks to, to life with your drumming and you're like well you want to tell stories too man and and exactly. as i say like wide open heart postcards from the hard road no apologies say goodbye yep. to mr sunshine uh and then self-titled dame My clark yeah yeah and man you, you got a great voice and you have great chops and who are these guys in your band are they knuckleheads you've known for 20 years you like to have beers with or well yeah i mean the so the guy that's been it doesn't always play on all the recordings that i do um but i've got a whole different group like so the backroom boys are myself and eric skull has been my guitar player for almost 20 years he's a fantastic singer guitar player keyboard player he's got a, he's got a master's in composition from cincinnati conservatory ah. he's a pretty he's a pretty sharp guy um but he's also a great blues guitar player go figure there you um go. and then my bass player is uh for everything we do live and he he plays on some songs but jack taylor and i've been well we've been friends since we were like 12 and uh we were in a band called tangent in the late 70s together oh it sounds very high school band oh it wasn't it was nothing but the who and and, oh, gotcha. and whatever but anyway it but we would go out on tangents during the songs but anyway he's been in my band now for a long johnny g was in my band for quite some time but he just you know he's got a school that he has to tend to and he's busy with that so but jack's been there for a long time i've gone through a succession of drummers it's like the new guy that i've got is a he's a minister also and he said dane playing drums for you is like is like preaching for billy graham in yes. other words it's tough man because you know you expect a lot are you tough on him or, or yeah yeah oh yeah because we work things out we'll sit here because i've got a little space over here with the band rehearsals a little pa and it's like you know that it has to feel right and eric doesn't come to these he doesn't have to he, he'll come and rehearse once before we play a whole bunch of shows but we'll sit down here and grind it's like i need to because i gotta sing Jack needs to because he hadn't played bass since last season that we did this and i've got to play the guitar and you, son, are going to hit those drums harder than you've ever hit them. It's like, I know we're just down here, but I can't hear you. And do, yeah, you don't want, nobody wants to be my drummer. Amazing. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that's, that, that is the hot seat. That would be like, kind of like, you know, Dave Grohl and, 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 and Taylor, you know, yeah. they've got that relationship. Mm. Um, I'm sure after a while it kind of wore off where it's like, Hey, you know, don't, don't be nervous, yeah. you know, right just, now. Yeah. Just do your thing. Just do your thing, but you got to get them up to where they can do that thing that you want them to do. Yeah. Or at least in your ears. You know? So when you go to do a, do you go to like the Bluebird and do sets or are you like a staple there? Isn't no. Isn't that, like a, isn't that in, the, in Indiana, the Bluebird? That, is like a yeah, that, that's, down in Bloom, that's down in Bloomington. Yeah, I'll yeah. be honest with you. I don't really like to play in clubs anymore because I'm yeah. an old guy. I like to be in bed at God, midnight on a weekend is a late time for me, man. I'm what about during the week? Are you how late? When are you going to bed during the week? I'm in my jammies at, at nine thirty, man. I'm laying on the couch by nine thirty. Yeah, I got because my, my wife, my wife, she works in since COVID. She's she does billing for a hospital, so she's got an off. She's up at six o'clock, so we're kind of early risers. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, we do mainly fairs and festivals in the summer. 
So nice. I go around to, yeah, you know, small town festivals and fairs, and we have a nice little circuit that we do. Already started booking them for this year. So now for uh for you going to the front position there, yeah. um do you forget words? Do you do you need a, an iPad or like do you have you know, little tricks? Or- so far, no. That's great. Um, but we don't learn a bunch of new stuff. I mean, we do have a backlog of tunes and also we were when we rehearse like if if we haven't played like we we struck up the band about a month ago and we hadn't played like the last show would have been in september last year so there was a couple songs i just i said i can't even remember the first line of this thing what is it so i have to sing it a few times you know since i don't have a teleprompter and then but once i've done that the muscle memory comes back so uh, but if i'm pretty good at making stuff up on the spot so if I get lost, I'm just going to spew out some kind of drivel that'll get us through till I, till I can hit the chorus or something. Thank God for that muscle memory, but it helps us in so many ways. Right. Has, um, has John said anything, uh, supportive or positive about your music? Has he taken the time to listen to any of it or he has, that's, that's he great. said, normally he'll say things to someone else about the compliment, but no, nice. he said nice things before. That's I mean, nice. he really, he really liked the, uh, a couple of the tunes on the pandemic record yeah was how was your not- pandemic man i was like you know i'm Dude. sure i'm sure that uh, well you actually re- you reached out to me once you were doing that thing with that drum you i'm trying to remember what that was now what was i doing during the pandemic well I, well yeah, you I had was- a you, you were doing some kind of thing you were showing this how to play this drum what was that a little hand drum or something am i am i like um, well, I had a, a uh, flashback acid flashback from my teenage years or well, you had the, something during the early pandemic. I was playing this, this cute little multi-tone drum that LP makes. It's very, they call it a that's, Dharma drum. It's like that's what it was. Drum. Yeah. Yeah. And I would just take it out to Joshua tree. Cause I spent the pandemic mostly in Los Angeles. And that was mm. a nightmare because oh, bet, man. Uh, I think, I think the Indiana living would be different from California living during the pandemic. It I prob- just about probably lost my was. mind. Yeah. Well, it, you know what? If I wouldn't have done songs from isolation, I would have went nuts. Yeah. Because they that gave you a focus for something every day. Yeah. I was writing songs like crazy. I had to, you know, write charts for everybody. Then I was mixing everything and you know, the record. The first songs were written the weekend after the pandemic started, which was the second weekend in March. And I think we were we were in, yeah. But the first song had come out in April, the first week of April, April eighth, I think, and yeah. that's when we got in USA Today, and I had the whole record finished by August. So twelve yeah. tracks. I, I didn't know it was going to be a whole record, but thank God it did give me something to do. You know, <laughs> my gosh, good lord, just yeah. to sit around. I mean, yeah. and the crazy thing is, is if you watch documentaries and you talk to like, you know, world health specialists, scientists, they say that they're going to just be coming more and more these pandemics. Mm. And I was like, you know what? I hope I'm not alive because that was not fun. Exactly. You know, because I'm a it, people it, person, you know, I'm half Italian, which makes me all Italian. And I just like, <laughs> I love, I love people. I miss people. I thrive on people's energy. I'm an extrovert. And that just about killed me. Like I ran Basically, I, I did a little practicing. I taught online. I basically stared into this little green light. I taught at MI. Yeah. I taught at the Drummers Collective. I taught at the New School. Kept me busy. And then I ran. I ran eight miles a day. I ran myself into a torn meniscus. Ow. And then I I've got done it that before. taken care of a year ago and then rehabbed and I'm, I'm back. Good, you know. Be but, careful uh, with the running thing, man. I did that for twenty years. I had to stop, man. I'm a, a certain age now where I have to do more I, cross training. Yeah, I, I I had to stop, but I ruined both of my knees doing Sucks. that. It's like, ugh. it's because I ran on concrete around a neighborhood. Yep. You know, duh. Me too, man. Me too, man. You know, <laughs> turn on the Walkman and go. Yeah, and I loved it. I mean, you know, I would do. I guess I was doing four miles, usually yeah. five days a week. Which That's wasn't great. a huge amount, but it kept, you know, kept the weight down. I love it. You know, I was yeah. able to drink more beer that way. Yeah, man. Really what? watch that. <laughs> yeah, Damn yeah, it. yeah. <laughs> so now it, you are, you're inspiring me with the 6 a.m. club. You know, I've got everybody in my band is um, married with children. And so they are in bed at 10 and up at 6 and working by 8. And, um, you know, my thing is if I can, if I 
getting up at 7 30 is like doing great but six just seems criminal you know what i mean but maybe i'll work it because it seems like you get into that mode the older you get you're like you get to the point where you're an early riser well that's that's the problem is i'm awake uh and i'll be honest with you she gets i didn't really say i necessarily got up at six she gets up at six I'm usually laying around in there until about seven or maybe yeah. seven thirty, but uh, but by then, but a lot of the times, man, I, it's hard for me to sleep through the night all the time. So I, I, you know, I'll have nights where it's three o'clock in the morning. Okay, I'm wide awake. I get up and read a little bit, and that'll yeah. usually put me back to sleep. But uh, yeah, sleeping through the whole night at sixty four years old and doesn't always happen, man. Unfortunately, yeah. yeah. Now. When you do read, are you uh, reading a physical book? Or are you an iPad Kindle guy? Nope. I'm a physical book guy. I'm a, so, and I also wanted to talk, I've got a podcast too, which what? is called music buzz with three Z's podcast.com. Buzz. And we have done 85 episodes. This yeah. Is you're our killing it, season. man. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, I just want to tell you, you're going to want to hear this because check out the drummers I've talked to Simon Kirk from uh bad company don brewer from grand funk love it doug clifford from credence all great guys jerry shirley from humble pie sweetheart yep jim mccarty from the yardbirds uh billy uh, bill gibson from huey lewis Kansas oh he's Summer. on next uh, next thursday bill's coming on is he well, yeah good. we'll tell him i see if he remembers dan clark of course the, he will man. Well, when guy. did you start this thing 80 episodes man that's killer yeah it's uh this is the fourth year yeah, man, Kenny I'm Jones, a... Matt Hello. Sorum, Jody Stevens from Big Star, if, if you know that band. Love it, Memphis boy, yeah. Yeah, great guy. Great, that this first power so... pop band. Yeah, man, one of my favorite bands. Well, Love this is em. awesome, man. You know, I might I yeah. might bug, I, you know, the funny thing is, is I have a lot of people that are like, man, you have access to huge, huge, huge guests. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to get to them. I said, but I want to get my, like, my personal friends on the show first. Sure. You know what I mean? And and capture that for all time, you know, because we came yeah. up together, you know. Right. And that's cool, man. Well, and I'll have to admit, so this is not just me. This is two other guys. There's, It's a guy named Hugh Syme who's an album cover artist who did all of Rush's stuff. Wow. And he actually played keyboards on 2112. It's called Music okay. Buzz. With three Zs. Love it. Yes. So, and Hugh, like I said, he did all Rush's album covers. He's done covers for White Snake and Celine Dion. You name it, he's done their, he's probably in the top five album cover people ever. He did this for my last record. Oh, that's gorgeous. That's an Memory elephant Mile. coming down a railroad track. Yeah, Memory Mile, which, by the way, has my friend Donovan on it. Uh, he co-wrote a song and co-sang it with me. The wow. only song he's ever written with anybody. And uh, The Donovan. Quite an honor. The Donovan. Donovan yeah. Donovan. Yeah, yeah. that's great. I like the idea of the play on the memory because elephants never forget. Exactly. Yeah. So anyway, the, so the other thing is, the other guy is Andy Wilson, and he's the guy that books everything and sends the Zoom thing out organizes it because he's a promoter so he gets people that are wanting to promote their newest record and they get a hold of him and then he we he checks on dates with us and that that's how our thing works so he does the heavy lifting but what i like to do is whoever it is that what they're promoting i take the time to really listen to what they've got and try to be honest and really just let's talk about every song on your record let's oh. tell me about this first song that kind of stuff and they appreciate that yeah you know? sure they appreciate the extra time Oh, I love it. Yeah. So how many, man. how many of these and how long you've been doing this, Rich? I think I'm, uh, on 168 over a four wow. and a half year period. Yeah. We were really aggressive. We did two episodes a week for the first couple of mm. years. And then I just wrote a book last year called making it in country music and insiders look at the industry. And I had a real publisher. It's a hardback. It came out last, uh, May and that took me a year to write. So during the course of that process, slowed down the podcast a little bit. Now we are back in with a vengeance. Slamming it. Yeah. How, how much? How, so uh, let me, I'm just very curious. Cause yeah, man. like I said, I write songs all the time, but, and I've always wanted to write a book, but it's just so daunting to know, man, I, it's gotta be that thick of songs I can get on one piece yeah. of paper. Well, I mean, you've, uh, you know, in your headlights, you should have on your radar at some point a, a memoir because, and I tell everybody, you can't do that until you're 60, wait till you're 60. So you're in your sixties. You got tons of stories, decades of stories. 
And the other thing that I think of for you would be some sort of method, uh, drum method, you know what mm, I mean? Sure. Which is, you know, and then uh, maybe something that's a coffee table book that has um, little stories and a lot of photos. You know, good. so all good ideas. Oh, and I have everything that I I always have a co-writer with the book because they help you get that fifty thousand foot view, get you out of your head. They can help you meet deadlines. So my first book, the drum book, I wrote with a guy who wrote eight books on the Civil War, so he knew how to get a project across the finish line. Then with oh, my sure. second book, I had a a guy that was, uh, you know, kind of like a writing hobbyist. He had a full-time job, but anyways, he was really interested in me. I was like, anybody interested in me? All right, come on, be on part of my team. And then the third project was with a, you know, a professional writer slash editor that does some ghost writing and stuff. So, you know, you got to split the profits, but hey, you know, the the book business, you know, Stephen King is really the only guy that's like taking it to the bank. For the rest sure. of us mere mortals, they're just business cards, you know. Right. Well, kind of like albums are for most folks these days. Come see us live and buy our hoodie. That's where the money's at. Right. Now, right? right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and I well, should have bought a, I should have bought a Mellencamp t-shirt that night at the Greek. I it was a really cool design. It was like a crying clown or something. Okay. It was whatever that album was, the sinners and hillbillies and clowns and hillbillies. Sad, sad clowns and hillbillies. Yeah. It was Carlene Carter was with us. Who's a dear friend of yeah, mine. And yeah, and Kenny came to the show. We were all hanging. Yeah, that's right. Kenny was there. That's that right. That was the first that time he saw you since he left the band. No, nah, was it? He, he said, This it, is the first time I have seen this band since I left. Oh, wow. I was like, Maybe wow. so. Wow. Maybe so. Yeah. And then on the way to my car that night, um, I saw a gorgeous white coyote. Wow. You know, because they come out at night in L.A. right there sure, in, the, in that sure. neighborhood, man, you know? Wow. Nuts. Um, Crazy. So what about the gear, man, for the for the kids, the the, the nerdy guys? They're like, well, they didn't talk about gear, man. What, like, if you, go, <laughs> if you go to see you at a Melody yeah. show, what are you playing? Just a little four-piece kit. Oh, right? yeah. Well, it's sometimes it depends on the tour. Uh, of course, I'm a DW guy. Uh, have mm -hmm. been for five or six years now. Yes, sir. Um, and so, so collector series kit, right? Yes, they they uh, it's uh, cherry wood and there's Beautiful. no reinforcement hoops. So my my story with uh, with John Good was, I went into his office and and we sat and talked for a while. And he said, "I want you to go go to the room, go play all the drum sets." You know, they got the room with all the kits set up. Yeah, yeah. So and I told him what I played. I said I played Noble and Cooley, and I like that open sound. There's no reinforcement hoops. So yeah. anyway, I'm going around playing these drums, and. I find the kit and I said, this is it. This is what I want. And he goes, you're going to get anything you want because that's the only drum set in here that doesn't have reinforcement hoops on it. So he knew that I had an ear that I had something and he appreciated that. And it was, it was this, I was playing a replica of the kit of, uh, of Mick Fleetwood. Mm -hmm. That's what he, he plays cherry drums. So they made me a ton of different sizes. So normally it's it's always the main kit so sometimes i have two drum sets on stage the, oh, yeah. I, I probably did it to greek yeah i probably had the cocktail kit and then the this kit yeah um so they made me a, just a ton of different drums that i could move around and motivate however i wanted but it's a 24 inch kick 13 16 toms and uh i actually use their um it's their version of a uh, black beauty yeah. snare me too. Which is, you use the same one? Live. Okay. Yeah. 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 And it's fantastic. And live. that's me, dude. 24, 13, 13, 16, 18. Well, come on now. High five. Ah. Bang. And it works. And then they're powerful drums. Yeah. And uh, Sabian? so I'm a Sabian guy. Yeah, man. Um, I, gosh, if you're going to ask me. Oh, yeah. So it's uh, AA18 crash in front of me. Mm -hmm. And then I've got a. I believe it's a uh, Memphis ride that I'm using right now. Oh, those are nice, kind of dry. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of dry. And the the, the engineer is always killing me. He's going about. The, I used to use a uh, AAX metal, and the bell was so loud. He goes, "Dude, that's the loudest thing on stage. I can't hear anything if you go to the bell. Can you just dink dink that bell?" I said, "No, man. If I'm gonna hit the bell, I'm gonna hit it." So the Memphis ride, he's much happier with me. Uh, and I got a 17 inch, they don't make AAs anymore. 
oddly. So it's a it's a paragon. Ah, right. But it sounds cool. And then I have fusion hats, uh, fourteen inch fusion hats. I nice. used to use thirteens like Vinny, but it's not like. And actually, in my studio, I've got fifteens that I yes. really like. You know what? Hat hat wise, I never ever play anything smaller than a fifteen. And then on the road, I play sixteen inch hats, man. Are you kidding me? Two sets of because I have the X hat over here, and people are like, "Why do you?" I said, "I don't need the X hat." One tour, you know, for about a decade, I've had the two sets of hi hats because you can, when you're over here on the right side of the kit, you could still get the the color of the hi hat, but then you get have more room to high stick. Uh, I got you, sure. So you know, it's kind yeah. of like a showman thing showman trick. Well, you, you just wait till you've had two rotator cuff surgeries mister. you've had two <laughs> and you'll be playing way down here. so you brought your symbols way down <laughs> my right? symbols are pretty far down yeah yeah i mean i've still i mean i go to the gym you know i with i work with the trainer three days a week just to make sure that my that the arms stay good but i can't do too much if i do the wrong thing and that pops off dude oh god you're done that's you're a, it's done it's scary man yeah it is i've scary. got the i don't Gotta know about you but a, a, another drumming injury is the um not the umbilical hernia you know the one that's a little bit closer to your you know your junk and so over on the left side I, you know it kind of pops out a little bit i got that all meshed up Ooh, on the left side you I've know i had that yeah, it, it can happen, you know, like Libs had it. I think a bunch of people have had it done where it's just like, it's kind of like God's cruel design where the flesh that kind of covers your lower, lower abdomen is not really muscle. It's just flesh. And then so if you're like really active and you squat and you play drums or you move gear, ah, mm. occasionally it pops out, you know? Yeah. Wow. I haven't had that thing. Knock on wood. Lucky man. I don't, I don't need any more of that stuff, man. I'm all meshed up. <laughs> well, be careful with these shoulders, man. Whatever. That's all I'm saying. I gots to be careful. Yeah, it ain't it ain't no fun. It ain't no yeah. fun. Um, and then uh I think that's that we've talked quite a bit, man. Your drumming influences, you as a songwriter and a leader working with working with John. We could probably go into the uh oh, I was gonna ask you, what are your heads? Is it if it's Remo, you oh, and I could do a Remo. clinic tour. You and I could do a clinic tour. We together. should. What's the do you play? We've Pro talked Mark? about doing this. No, I don't. I pay Vic Firth. Hey, well, those are great sticks. So they are. three out of our companies are the same. What about LP, Rhythm Tech? Um, Toka. Toka, yeah. Which is actually owned by the DW family now. It is now, isn't it? it yeah. It's changing. It's crazy. Yeah. There's very few mom and pop businesses. Everything is coming to big conglomerates. Yeah, and I guess that's just the way it's going to be. There's that's nothing. life. That's right. Ta -da! <laughs> hey what about the uh the fave five this is that person the portion of the show we i five favorite things favorite color green all right my first green favorite food it could be a favorite food or dish um i would have to say pizza you can't screw up pizza man come on man even when That's... it's bad it's good it's good you know yeah greasy old fried up pepperoni great just bring it on now i went to a pizza joint in seymour and the guy working behind the the counter and they they had they it was also a, like a like a micro brewery and they had like really strong beer and the guy told me yeah man i know the melon camps and i know john's dad and they come in here and da, 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 da. it was like a i forget where it was but it was in seymour indiana why were you in seymour indiana is my question <laughs> on the way to Asic, because it's always in Indianapolis. Oh, oh yes, it is. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Crazy, right? I don't you know if you know the there. spot. I don't know that spot. No. It's crazy. But um, everybody everybody there at least says that they know the Mellon Camps. Of course. Everybody in town. Yeah, you got to go. And, and, and yeah. as you're driving from Nashville, you, you go past the uh, Mellon Camp Highway. Yes, that's correct. It's crazy, man. Yeah. You get a highway or a street named after you, you're doing pretty good. Doing uh, all right. Favorite drink? Um. Well... If it's an alcoholic drink, come on, uh, um, Miller Lite. I'm a hillbilly. Miller Lite, but I also like Cabo Wabo. Miller uh, Lite and a Cabo Wabo shot, chilled. Yeah, chilled. Yes. Sip it. I don't really. Sh I just kind of have a beer and a, yeah, know, maybe one shoot. tequila and we're we're too old to shoot several beers. Too old to shoot liquor, man. Come on now. <laughs> what are we eighteen? 
That's a young man's game. I know. We probably did it well into our 30s. We probably shouldn't have. Okay, this one is difficult. This is difficult for a lot of people, and it could probably change day to day. But you're cruising in your car. This thing comes on the radio. It's just one of your favorite songs. It just keeps coming into your life. It will not leave. Wow. Um, You know one song that I hear that's still just, and I just want to drive a little bit faster, Running on Empty by Jackson Brown nice it's like dude when i hear that it just takes me back to i don't know probably i was a senior in high school or something when that came out and man i just want to drive a little bit faster another one night moves by bob seger oh yeah i mean come on now points of her own sitting way up high Woo! <laughs> come on now it's dude, just yeah it's great and no. now, both of those songs are and maybe it's interesting enough that they're both reflective songs about a guy thinking about his past so i don't know Yes. Maybe I like to do that. We are in a reflective chapter of our lives. Um, finally, favorite film, favorite movie. You're going to watch it no matter what. If, it, if you see it on TV. <laughs> Christmas Vacation. <Get> her <laughs> it, it depends on the time of year. That would only be there. Um, you know, gosh, it's hard to limit that to one. I know, isn't it? I, I, well, uh, I mean, one of I, my, get, I get a lot green, of Shawshank Redemption. The Green Redemption. Mile. I was getting ready to say Shawshank Redemption slash Green Mile yeah. are right there at the top. And, it, and of course, then there's the holiday favorites. That's a whole different. And that's crazy game. how we brought up Stephen King today in the same conversation. And usually one of his films will make it. Usually a, 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 a Tarantino film will make it for somebody. Usually a, uh, um, yeah, one of the, 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 the guys that did the Fargo's. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, Stephen, Brothers. Stephen King and John did the musical that I played in that we did in Atlanta for six weeks and about 11 years ago, and then we took it on tour. Oh, my God. And, tell me about this. Yeah, it was. it's called Ghost Brothers of Darkland County, wow. and it was, uh, we were, the band was on stage, and that's where I developed the, and I, I didn't really talk about it a lot, but a lot of these Mellicamp records in the last 10 years or so. So, uh, hardly ever used just a pair of sticks. It was either two brushes, a brush, and maybe a shaker stick. And I used these rattle mallets that they used to have, Vic Firth. I've only got like three mallets left, so I don't yeah. use them very often because if the head pops off, you're done. Yeah. Um, so that's where I came up with kind of a hybrid kit that I used on quite a few records. I haven't used it lately, but it's a real dark sounding because it was t-bone i was trying to go for this kind of thing he liked i had actually a 18 inch drum uh kick drum turned on its side that had no muffling in it so it just boom like that and i was playing with mallets so i had a cocktail bass drum and i'm trying to remember the sizes i guess it was a 12 inch and a 14 hi-hat and then that bass drum over here i only had two cymbals and they were both really odd and i would switch them out um and that's kind of developed a sound there that i used on a lot of those belly camp records but we took that so but anyway i was getting around to so we took it on tour with all these actors and stuff it was interesting the band guys were on one bus and the actors were on the other it's just <laughs> you know oil and water a little bit they were all nice enough it yeah. was fine but uh but steven i he did buy me lunch when we were uh when we were doing rehearsals so i got to That's sit around and actually spend an hour with him just kind of talking see how about his brain works well his brain works you know why he got has all those books the guy works from 7 30 in the morning till like two or three in the afternoon every day he writes just he writes. writes that long he just sits there and writes that's right duh you know, if you want to get good at something, why don't yeah. you do it? You just you do gotta it. do yeah. it, man. That work ethic, look, yeah. Look what you've done. All the stuff you're into, my lord, you got to be the busiest guy I know. <laughs> God bless you. Well, the, you know, the funny thing is, I appreciate it, brother. It's all just kind of an extension of uh, of the first love and the first creative outlet, which was being a drummer. And then when you realize, oh my God, I I have a heart of a teacher. I I like mentoring. And then oh, I'm a pretty good writer. I was on the yearbook stuff. And you just kind of feel what see what some of your other God given talents are. Now, if yeah. I was a if I I have a front man personality, I wish I had a front man voice like you. You know what I mean? But listen <laughs> to this. You know, I'm not a singer. I'm a I'm a you know. Um, 
but uh, yeah, your the body of work is incredible. You know, to be able to to get a job and hold a job for twenty eight years, you get you get any um, uh, wind from John about is he going to do this till he croaks on stage or is he? He doesn't seem to want to quit. That's so great. that um, is so good. I'm, I'm just kind of banking on it going for a little bit longer. I mean, yeah. you know, I've been here this long. I don't intend on going anywhere. And uh, yeah, man, he has talked about at some point maybe doing a greatest hits thing down the road. Beautiful. And he also said if we do that, then we might be looking towards that being about it. Mm. So hopefully nice. that doesn't happen for a while. Hopefully yeah. it's just we just keep keep the keep the train a rolling keep the train a rolling dude yes. there's there's nothing better than a steady job in the music business it is such a rare rarefied thing to find hey i was going to tell you really quickly you know about the um you know the shaker mallet things yeah. uh you're worried about breaking the ones you have because they don't make them anymore or whatever but there is a company you might be interested because in, everyone's got all these little bells and whistle like mallet hybrid things now but uh yeah. there's a company called headhunters percussion they're in canada and okay. um Look at the website, and if you want, I'll introduce you to the guys. But I met him at NAM shows yeah. about a decade ago. But they make all sorts of fun little, um, pitchy, you know, Wilco, coachy type cool. crazy things, you know. Yeah, well, dude, yeah, yeah man. shaker Maybe. brushes and shaker mallets and bead mallets and things glued I want together. Em. I want them. Yeah. yeah. So we'll talk at we'll talk afterwards. Okay. Uh, got kind of look at look up uh the some of the stuff Head online. I'll just connect it. Headhunters I percussion. Will. Yeah. Yeah. Man. I'll check it out. That's and awesome. I love it, man. We you know we got good taste for playing the same gear, man. I love it. See, come on yeah. now. <laughs> hey, awesome, we've man. always we we hit it off the very first time we met, man. We've always had a good time together. So oh, we I, sure I, I hope there's a soon to have a a cold one. I'd love to do you. it. I'll, man, I'll enjoy some Miller Lights, dude. I'm kind of an IPA guy, man. But you know, I'll, I'll drink whatever. Well, I mean, I can have an IPA, but it's, if you have three of those, it kind of hurt the next day. I know. You turn into Orson Welles. <laughs> it's just bloated, bro. That's right. <laughs> you know, Winston Churchill. <laughs> it's incredible. <laughs> so if guys want to reach out to you, like uh, pick your brain or find you, uh, uh, DaneClark.com, best part? Da DaneClark.com is the best way. You can leave a message for me there. Yep. Beautiful. And then how do people find this amazing podcast? Is that on like Apple Podcasts and everywhere? It's everywhere. Just you got to remember, you got to have the three Z's music buzz, buzz yeah. podcast.com. I love that's it. That's us. Ladies and gentlemen, that's awesome. Dan Clark, man. This is awesome. And if you're loving the show, subscribe, share, rate, and review. It helps people find the show. And next time, we'll probably have our co producer, co host, Jim McCarthy, Jim McCarthy voiceovers.com. We always appreciate his time and talent. Dane, this is a real pleasure to spend this time with you, man. Rich, it's been fun, man. I'm glad we finally got around to getting to do this. I appreciate you, brother. Appreciate you, buddy. And hopefully we'll see you in the flesh very soon. Yes, sir. How about see another everyone. high five? High fives. We'll see you next time. This has been the Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts.